Welcome to the flagship studio at the 2024 JPM Healthcare Conference in San Francisco. I'm Justine levin Allerhand. I'm a senior partner at Flagship Pioneering, and I'm joined with these wonderful panelists for a discussion on the power of diverse boards. I'm going to start with an, introducing our panelists, then we'll go into questions. Sue Desmond Hellman is the former CEO of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the former chancellor of UCSF. Cynthia Patton is the general counsel and secretary of flagship founder at Tessera Therapeutics. And Francis Arnold, Nobel laureate and Linus Pauling professor of chemical engineering, biochemistry, and bioengineering, and a board member of flagship founder Generate Biomedicines. So welcome, everyone. I'm going to begin with a general question about board work. Um, you know, given your experience on different types of boards over the years, what do most effective boards have in common? Sue, so should we start with you? Sure. Um, most effective boards have in common um, clarity about their role, mm -hmm. about who they're accountable to and what's on their agenda. Mm -hmm. um, the least effective times I've been uh, in a board discussion have been when we either veer into what really is management mm -hmm. or when we're not clear on what the problem is we're working to help management solve. Mm -hmm. Um, well, I'm going to say diversity is one thing, <laughs> since that's what we're here to talk about. Yeah. But um, also a really good board chair, mm -hmm. someone who understands that when you have a diverse board, it's hard work and you have to really um, use that mantle as chair to make sure that everybody's voice is heard mm -hmm. and that, to your point, everyone understands the reason that the board is there. Francis, from your experience, anything else? So in? that's interesting that you say the good board chair. Of course, that's helpful. But I think that the most important thing is that people rode together. Mm -hmm. They're diverse mm -hmm. and they have different perspectives, but they're very respectful of other people's perspectives and learn how to incorporate those well. They get along and listen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, we, we were going to talk later in the session, but I'd love to bring it forward here is, you know, board dynamics mm -hmm. and what are the ways, what are the strategies that you've seen either as a board member, you know, jumping into the conversation or just even observing and what are the elements that you think have been, you know, the factors of success there? Well, I do think that both, um, both diversity and this kind of collegiality, I would say, um, um, play a role in that. It, it, when you feel at the board that everyone's voice matters mm -hmm. and that a different perspective, a unique perspective is welcome and contributes, there's a richness to the conversation. And I do think that comes from the chair, but it can't only come from the chair. Mm -hmm. It has mm -hmm. to come from everyone um, welcoming, picking up on even um, stopping the conversation and say there's the kind of thing that you've all heard, there's a couple of people who haven't spoken yet. Mm -hmm. um, th that's always welcome because often those couple people don't know that their voices are welcome. Right, right, absolutely. Yeah, and going back to the board chair, currently I sit on a board and it is an incredibly diverse board, not just um, gender-based diversity, mm -hmm. but uh, it's really quite fascinating what people have done, you know, in their careers, what part of the country they're from. And our board chair has done a really good job of setting the tone to your point of saying when we're in executive session, going around the table and asking everyone, what is their point of view? Something that I've rarely seen before. And then that models for the rest of the board that everyone's voice is important. Mm -hmm. And the different expertises that are in the room, it's really important if you're, I'm, I'm a lawyer by training and a compliance officer, so I understand risk really well. But I also have been an operator, so I understand that as well. And the board chair and also our CEO take the time to ask me questions that tune into those levels of my expertise and they do that for everyone else in the room. And then that gives someone else who is, say, a CFO by training, they'll look to me and say, Cynthia, what do you think about the risk issue, not the financial risk issues, but the operational risk issues? Because now they get, oh, that's why she's on this board, because you don't necessarily know why everybody's there when you first get there. Um, Francis, anything to add there? Yeah. 
Okay, yes. great. Um, you know, earlier today, I want to pivot when thinking about, so you have this wonderful board dynamic. We you know the, the pieces that need to be in place. But you know, sadly, unfortunately, we lived, earlier today, Nubar Fayan released his uh, 2024 annual letter, and he talked about um, the current state of polycrisis when you have a series of global existential threats kind of all at the same time. And you know, he argued that perhaps you could use that as a, a potential to transform mm -hmm. this destabilized time into a poly opportunity, which is obviously a, a positive perspective that we should all take. And um, articulating ways you can do that, I think, is critical. But as a result, oftentimes we're in a boardroom and there are a series of challenges or crises. And, you know, that foundation, strong foundation, how do you use that to navigate through a crisis or even a poly crisis mm -hmm. that was being argued today? Well, that's where the different perspectives play a, a key role, right? Without people who've had different experiences in navigating crises or who just look at the problem in a different way, you won't have the new ideas that it takes to navigate a poly crisis, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And I've I've learned so much from being on the boards that yeah. I'm on. We've navigated quite a few yeah. crises yeah. recently, yeah. and um, I learn every time that we get together. Yeah, you know, Francis, you obviously a, a a highly regarded, well deserved Nobel laureate, and you know, in science that happens all the time, right? You go in one one direction. And then all of a sudden, you get a result that you don't expect. And how is how is the scientific method actually? Well, I'm very grateful uh, that impacting. the boards I'm on think that diversity means having a scientist on the board. <laughs> <laughs> that works, right? <laughs> yeah. And we and do chemist, think differently. Right, biologists. Like <laughs> other so other thoughts, and you've obviously uh, been in leadership roles too, beyond just a board role. And yeah, no, so. I think one of the the um, the aspects that that I've noticed over over the the passage of time, because it, when I look at um, be, interacting with the board at Genentech, I wasn't on the board, but mm -hmm. interacted a lot um, with the board. And then I was on Procter and Gamble's board. Mm -hmm. I was on Facebook's board, and now on Pfizer's board. So being on these mm -hmm. big visible boards, um, one of the things that strikes me is is the board's ability to go through times of optimism and pessimism. Mm -hmm. In just as successful a fashion, mm -hmm. um, you'll have board members who uh, are diverse in their uh, um, belief mm -hmm. in the future, um, mm -hmm. or that you know the the sky is falling. W what I like, and I think it does go back to um, uh, um, being orderly. Mm -hmm. I, I find it's it's why I like risk management and compliance. <laughs> I, I sort of like just tell me the rules, I'll follow them. You know. <laughs> But I also think boards work best when they're orderly. Mm -hmm. You know, you have the executive session, you mm -hmm. have, and and the orderliness that I value during challenging times, mm -hmm. what do we have to get done? Mm -hmm. What's gonna make 2024 a great year? Mm -hmm. So what are the goals? What are the things we have on our plate? What what are the biggest risks we face? And that that sense of, of order, I think when you interact, not just with the CEO, but the entire management team, that order is contagious. Mm -hmm. So, okay, here's mm -hmm. what the board expects from us on behalf of the shareholders. Right. That for me is, is a, a kind of a heuristic that when you do that serially, and then when you have performance issues, it's like, well, here's what we talked about. Yeah. Why didn't it go well? Yeah. Or why did it exceed? Mm -hmm. That person's really performing um, beyond your expectations. I think that mm -hmm. if you combine the diversity of view and background that we've all been talking about with some orderliness, that kind of makes a platform for a board that's highly functioning. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't mean everything great will happen, right. but it allows for great things yeah, to happen. Yeah, in some ways what I'm hearing is almost the calm in the storm. Right, there's going to be I a storm out there, yeah. and you need to have something that could center you. It's a bit of an anchor for people. It does, yeah. it does yeah. um, provide that. And, and w the hardest thing for a company that they do uh, with a board is is go through a change of CEO. Mm -hmm. It's really hard, mm -hmm. super hard. And that's when you you want that that um, board clarity and that board rigor and discipline, so that it doesn't feel political or weird. It feels like this is good for the company. Yeah, yeah. And, that, and that goes back to what's your role? Yeah, and, you know. what are you doing? Yeah. Um, I was, can I, can yeah, I touch please. a little bit on um, this poly crisis thing mm -hmm. with, as we talk about diversity, diversity of experiences helps you when you're dealing with 
crises because you have, hopefully you have a board that's been there, done that many times. And so when the board is calm during the crises, that helps management mm -hmm. to be calm during the crises as well. And the other thing that I've learned both being on management and being on the board is management senses when the board is behind them. And if they feel that the board is not behind them, you can slowly see leaders leaving the organization because they don't have the trust of the board. And so it's so important to be calm during these crises, to let management know that you trust them, but also to do your job and to give the advice and to ask the strong questions. You know, we always say trust but verify. Mm -hmm. And that's really important. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Francis, anything else to add? Uh, I have to agree with Sue about yeah. the difficult uh, cold of finding a new CEO. We just went through that at Illumina. Oh. <laughs> it was a that was a lovely experience. <laughs> <laughs> lovely, such a lovely word. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but it is the most important thing that we can do. Yeah. Right, is find sure. the right leaders. Number one job. And, mm -hmm. Yeah, and I love your perspective, Francis, because speaking about you know being at a public company board versus being at a private company board, where are the differences? So obviously, CEO, there's a CEO in every single version of that. You know, what are the are there aspects that you say actually it's the same? It's the same structure. It's the same common threads, or you really well, some have to... of them are, are obviously the same. I'm I'm on the board of Alphabet and Illumina, yeah. but also a number of really small mm -hmm. companies, and the small companies would like to be an Alphabet, right? <laughs> so. What, what are the ideas that make sense? What are the ideas that don't make mm -hmm. sense? And maybe I don't know the right idea, but I know how to write, ask the right questions mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's right. You know, um, I would imagine that over uh, the course of, of each of your experiences, um, you know, you've been um, the, you know, probably the first, the only or few of on a board of whatever, whether it be a scientist, a woman, um, you know, different backgrounds. You know, how have you navigated those experiences? And I think there are some people in the audience are also have never been on a board. How did you get that first board role? And I, I think they're, they're, they may be interconnected or not, um, but I would love to pivot the conversation to that because people have that over the course of their careers and particularly in a board setting and how best to navigate that. You want to start? Well, I'll start. <laughs> so I can't remember how I got my first board role because it was so long ago. Um, but it was an, a nonprofit organization. And what I do recall is I was the general counsel for a Medicare Advantage plan. And our CEO had a rule that everyone on his CEO staff had to be on a board. His, his, he said, you know, you're part of the community. It's important. And also will help you learn as an executive and also help you facilitate how you interact with our board. So that's why I got on my first board and it was the best gift that he ever gave me. Great advice. Yes. Yeah. And to being the, the first or the only, um, I don't think there's ever been a time in my life, frankly, that I wasn't either the first woman or the first African American in where whatever setting I was in. And there are two things that I've learned through that. One is be the best that you can be when you're there because you're representing not just yourself, but you're representing other, other people. Learn as much as you can. When you get on these boards, it is amazing the wealth of information and esteem that you're sitting around. And so you're learning just as much as you're giving. That's really important. And then the third thing is to make sure that you don't remain the only one. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, I was thinking about in 2020 or thereabouts when a lot of states were doing this thing where you have to have three women on a board. So you'd get three women on a board and everybody would sit back and go, okay, we're done. There are three women on the board. So to me, that means no, we're gonna get four, five, six, seven, eight women on the board. We're gonna get the that's best a, people. Exactly. And a lot of them and are that, women. And, a lot of them are women. <laughs> and that's always my mentality is who's not represented in the room and how do I make sure, not just that I'm speaking for them, but that I'm helping them get into the room? Mm -hmm. Well, I got my first board because I made my own company and I put myself <laughs> on the board. <laughs> and that worked pretty yeah, well. Yeah, absolutely. So I like that. <laughs> yeah, said, absolutely. Giving, giving advice rather than running a company. It's a lot of work to, yeah. to be in management. Sue, you know that. I know that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I will say, though, that the, in the 14 years I was at Genentech, 
some of my um, most important interactions were with our board of directors. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I had so much respect for the board and their role. Mm -hmm. And I learned so much about what we were accountable for. Mm -hmm. by interacting with the board because, you know, I, I'm a doctor. I just right. show up and I, I don't, I didn't know, you know, what an earnings per share was before <laughs> I went to Genentech. So interacting with the board was, was to, to your point, it's like a class, mm -hmm. you know, it was mm -hmm. great. Yeah. And so I, I um, wanted to experience a, a corporate board that was more like Genentech's board because I had such a positive experience. So when I was uh, chancellor at UCSF, I told a couple of people that I was interested in boards, but I couldn't be on a pharma or biotech board, in my opinion, because of the conflicts. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's when I joined Procter & Gamble's board, um, which I thought was a fantastic experience. I, um, I wanted to learn more about marketing and branding. Um, I have this great picture of me that's and the great. Charmin bear <laughs> as evidence of how much I learned about branding <laughs> on the tarmac in Utah. Yeah. yeah. So, so being the only, so many, um, uh, there's so much to say, but I'll say one concrete thing. Um, one thing that I started doing when I was at uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation was that instead of saying no when someone called me to be on a board, I would say no, but I have a list of two or three people yes. mm -hmm. who I really encourage you to meet mm -hmm. um, because they're great. Mm -hmm. You may not know about them, um, and I think they would do a good job on a board. So, um, so I think the the kind of ma make sure there's more people who are like you mm -hmm. is is a great tactic. There are four women on um, Pfizer's board. Mm -hmm. The chair of the audit mm -hmm. committee, the chair of the science and technology committee are women. Uh, Helen Hobbs is one of the longstanding board members, and it feels like, gee, this is um, right. this doesn't feel like oh, there's a woman on the board. Yeah. It feels board. like okay, it's a board, <laughs> yeah. And um, and so I think that's that's a, a we've come a ways. We mm -hmm. have more to go, and, and I think to Francis's point, there's a lot of talent. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of diverse talent. It isn't a box ticking exercise. It isn't to to seem like a good company. It's because you want great voices in that boardroom uh, to drive where your company's going and your values. Yeah. Um, well, also what I've seen is that in a time of crisis, you know who does all the work? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I do. <laughs> uh, well, it's, it's interesting you, you talk about um, giving names of other people. I've made a point of staying in touch with recruiters and whenever anyone comes to me and says, hey, I'm interested in being on boards, mm -hmm. I start just sending, going down my roster, sending emails to the various recruiters that I know because getting on a public company board is very hard mm -hmm. and recruiters go to the same pool mm -hmm. all the time. Mm -hmm. And when I left um, Amgen and said, I wanna do board work, recruiters were like, well, you're a lawyer, nobody's gonna be interested in you. And you know, I had to market myself to them to say, here are all the things that I can bring I you know, to a board. And my first public company board ended up being um, Organon, and that's because someone was at the company who knew me. And then, guess what happened? All the recruiters started calling me, oh, would you be interested in this board and that board? And it's like, oh, what happened to nobody's gonna be interested in a lawyer? <laughs> so you have to really push these recruiters. Yeah, and the one thing, the two theme, themes I'm hearing from this conversation is one, the power of the network, mm -hmm. that you know, mm -hmm. leverage your network and both raise your hand, but then also make sure that you are helping your network and you know, building mm -hmm. your network. Um, but then also know your value proposition, mm -hmm. you know, and really understand what your superpowers are and what your value proposition mm -hmm. is setting. Because I, I thought your comment, Cynthia, around the notion of you may be tagged as the lawyer, but mm -hmm. you have a wealth of operational experience that may be quite relevant. But unless you actually talk about it, people That's aren't right. going to know because they're going to just lean into the title mm -hmm. of whatever role that you may have, um, which is you know, which is fine, but not sufficient. Um, you know, the other aspect, we talked a little bit earlier about board dynamics, but I want to come back just as we think about practical advice around if you are one of the, you know, one only or one of the few, ensuring that your voice is heard. And has that been a challenge? Has that, are there strategies kind of from a practical standpoint to ensure that you are maximizing that board community that seems to be so powerful in the, the successful boards that you've been on? Well, 
I'm not shy, so <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that's not a big issue. The, the one thing that I think is important, though, um, is in addition to speaking up, and just as importantly, not speaking when you, you don't have something to have. I don't think you need to talk all the time. The, but doing your homework is so important. Reading the board material, asking people questions, especially if you want more information about something, going for a deeper dive. Or like I'm, I always try and say, did I read some papers that will help me understand something, or, um, or keep abreast of the the both the press and the literature on, on what we're talking about. All really important. The the one thing I still find is challenging is. Um, it's easy to be binned. I think this is true if you're male or female, no, no matter what your background is. So coming as a sort of R person with an R&D background, it's sort of obvious what committees people will put you on and how they think of you. Both Procter & Gamble and Facebook, I was on the audit committee the entire time. Um, and yet people very rarely ask me anything or think I bring anything on, on audit or finance because... And that's not my background. Right. And it says MD after my name. Yeah. So I think that there's there's a sort of a sense that um, each board member does bring sort of a holistic operations uh, background with them. Mm -hmm. And and that's where it, speaking up and adding to the conversation when you do have um, more information, I think is important. Right. And to Francis' point earlier, asking the right questions. Right? Mm -hmm. so you're not necessarily going to be an expert in every single sub area, right. so asking the right questions. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I want to pivot to thinking about in the life sciences, especially in biotech. Um, you know, boards are built from day one, but the company mm -hmm. evolves over time, and especially mm -hmm. in bioplatform companies that we have at Flagship. How have you thought about whether you've been on nominate nom gov co committee or involved in nominating, you know, peers? How do you think about board building in a life sciences company, in a bioplatform company? And are there things that that we should be keeping in mind um, as we together, as a life sciences community, build out these boards and have the right governance to do this difficult work that we know is is so challenging? It's a great question. And um, my stint at Tessera is the first time that I've been at a startup. Mm -hmm. And it's been interesting to me because you have a small board, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. three to five people on these boards, and there's a lot of work for them to do. And you're leaning more on the science mm -hmm. than you are even on the regulatory side with these smaller boards. And I think the challenge is at what point do you say, we need someone with a regulatory background? We need someone with a risk background. Um, to me, the sweet spot is around five to six years, you know, depending on where the company is in, in its life cycle. But you have to look at where the company is in the life cycle and how complicated the business is. Because it's even like building your, your company itself. If you wait too long, you will have missed a lot of issues along the way and then you're trying to, mm -hmm. to fix it. Yep. So you've got to be always thinking, where is this company in this life cycle? What are the expertise that we need? And don't worry about we're a small company. I, I hear this a lot. Oh, we only have 500 people. 500 people, there could be a lot of complexity, almost mm -hmm. as much as if you have 4,000 people in a company. But Justine, you do that, yeah. right? That's your job. Yeah. What, <laughs> Tell yeah. us what you think. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, I, I think, I think that, thanks for, for asking, Francis. Um, I, I agree with Cynthia. You almost have to take a future backwards look. You know, mm -hmm. in many ways, that's how we think around our, our platforms, around our science. And we say, okay, where do we want to end up? And then mm -hmm. how do you fill in the pieces? That's and right. the order of that may vary as a function of what's happening. And you have to iterate mm -hmm. and you have to then decide. And then you also have to think about as the company grows and where the needs change, how do you evolve the board the way that you're evolving the science, the way that you're evolving your, your development plan, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So a board should be dynamic. You also, you don't want it to be chaotic, yeah. but you want to think about the dynamism. And I think- So you fire people? Well. I wouldn't say we, we, we fire, but, um, but but one does need to say what makes sense for the company. And I think, mm -hmm. um, you know, you do have to uh, think carefully and ensure that you are not just bringing someone on for the next two years. You're actually thinking about how does this person think about the multiplicity of people's backgrounds? Mm -hmm. How do they come in and actually help at the various stages? Right. Right. Um, and I do, and I do think that that's, that that's needed. And, you know, and, and especially in a moment of crisis, right? You could have mm -hmm. some episodic 
situation where having the, the, the diversity of perspectives is just going to be critical. Well, you're in a very special position with flagship mm -hmm. because yes. you actually bring in board members who have expertise. They're not just investors, yes. right? Yes. And it's, it's a painful experience to be in crisis on a board where it's investors yes, who are on the board. That's right. right. Yeah, that's right. The construction of a flagship board is different. It's given not very, yeah, right. 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 That's right. That's well, right. Yeah. <laughs> or constructive, right? The right. constructive. Mm -hmm. Because when you're in a difficult that's right. situation, that's really when people need to row together. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and that alignment. That you know, alignment. And that's, and that's right. when the expertise and the understanding the industry right. is Absolutely. really important. Yeah, and we want everyone on the board to help realize the vision of that mm -hmm. bioplatform, mm -hmm. to be a multi-product bioplatform to help across a number right. of different disease areas. Um, so maybe I'll pause there and turn to the audience, see if there are questions. There are obviously many questions. I'm eager to engage folks here. They have questions. Yes. Yeah, thank you. We'll take a look at a mic. Oh, thank you. So could you comment a little bit more on the perfect size of a board and also board participation, board meeting participation? I mean, because I think you also want to balance creating a relationship with the whole leadership team. At the same time, these boards can get like super big. You have board observers and so on, right? I mean, so what is perfect? And maybe focus on earlier stage companies because I know that, yeah, public companies might be different here, right? I don't know if I would say that there's a perfect size um, for earlier stage companies. I'd, I'd say a minimum of five people um, feels good because you then get to have some diversity. If you're much smaller than that, you tend to only be scientists or maybe investors. And so you want to go beyond scientists and investors. Beyond scientists? <laughs> <laughs> you want a lot of lawyers. <laughs> so I agree. I'd say five to eight people, like for a small size. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think it's, I think of three parts of a board meeting. The part where if you bring the senior management team to participate, you know, mm -hmm. the presentations, the dialogue, that that senior management team benefits from that dialogue, and then executive session with the CEO, and then executive session without the CEO. Um, and, and again, it, it, regularizing that, having people expect it, is really valuable. Great. Sigal. Sure. So speaking of scientists, <laughs> what have you found are some of the biggest challenges in just bridging the gap of communication between the scientists on the board, mm. the investors on the board, mm. people with more operating, you know, industrial experience? And what are the strategies you've taken that you've seen work best to really merge this communication for everybody to speak the same language going forward? Well, not everybody's going to speak the same language, yeah. but the most important is listening, yeah. right? Everyone has to listen really deeply to understand the different perspectives. Scientists will listen once in a while. <laughs> <laughs> I, I found it really important when I'm on boards to develop a relationship with all of the board members outside of the board meeting. So whether it's at the cocktail party or the dinner or my reaching out and saying, hey, I'm flying in a day early. Can we go to dinner? Can we go to lunch? So that I understand their perspective, get a better handle on what their expertise is, and they do the same to me. Mm -hmm. And then you find that you'll be in meetings where, and everybody's heard this term, where folks will start to amplify each other mm -hmm. because they've developed that relationship, that trust, and that respect. That's a great point. The, the best scientists are able to explain mm -hmm. what they're doing mm -hmm in ways that everyone can understand. And so having that as an expectation for board presentations, I think is um, essential um, so that you kind of level set. It, somebody on the board who can really dive deeper on the science is a great asset, mm -hmm. but you shouldn't expect that everyone on the board can do that. And, and that's a skill set and a learning that those scientists can use, you know, at JP Morgan and mm -hmm. <laughs> with investors and the public. And when you're selling someday, it's essential. Yeah. You asked the question about strategy, um, you know, with being the only or, mm -hmm. or speaking up. And early in my career, I was always a little bit intimidated in the room. And I, I became a general counsel when I was just about 30. And so I was like, I don't know why I'm here, what I'm doing. And I developed two strategies. One was I would mark down every time someone would say something that I had thought about. And that started giving me confidence of, oh, you're, you know, you're on, on the right track. And then I started 
finding someone and purposely asking them to be my ally. So to amplify things that I said or give me feedback at the end of the meeting. And now I found that I don't need any of those strategies anymore. I have the confidence. But I also notice who in the room might need that assistance. And I provide it for them. Right. And to bring back a theme from earlier when we were talking about the right kind of board dynamic, with the mm -hmm. right kind of board dynamic, you can then ask those follow-up questions when the science is not clear. When when it's a question of, is this just interesting to go deep to understand it? Yeah. Does this you know, directly mm -hmm. impact the strategy of what we're trying to implement right now? How do we bridge that? And just pushing to answer those questions if the science is not understandable. Yeah. And those if you don't understand see. something, just say, I don't understand. Mm -hmm. and, you know, scientists, maybe more so than anyone else, really like to talk. <laughs> <laughs> Lucy. Thank you very much. Such an interesting discussion. Can I come back to talent pipeline and some of our leaky bits of the talent pipeline? Mm. And I push back against the idea of it's sort of too hard to reach. So what do you do to find ways of engaging groups or populations that have previously been characterized as too hard to reach? Such a, such a good, such a good so, question. So I'll, I'll start by going back to the comment around network. I think really mm -hmm. taking an active role in building out the network, meaning if there are, you look at your own network and ask them, are there individuals that you can introduce me to from this, mm -hmm. this group or that group? Or just to say, sh share with me some of the best people you know. And on that list is like people from very different backgrounds. And does that ever amplify the bias? Um, it's a good question. I think one has to ensure that when building out the network to really put put some checks and some guardrails and, and really be honest with yourself to say, am I networking with just one subgroup and that's not mm -hmm. actually creating the diversity needed? Yeah. Well, um, we did it welcome. this morning. I woke up yes, or last, right. or last yes, night yeah, and, last and night. thought of a, a person who I think would be great for a flagship board and emailed and said, right. hey, here's a here's a great name for you. Right, right, right. And you had sent me someone a couple of weeks ago, I said, that's yeah. someone already I'm speaking to. That's great. Thank yes. you for that vote of confidence. So now I know even more so that someone okay. I should be engaging with. So it always helps to, to build that out. And but to I, provide but that I think to that. your point, you have to make sure your network is broad and diverse, yeah. and you're not just going to the same people all the time, um, like the same recruiters all the time, because they're just, everybody's going to the same well. It's like, um, we're not in Boston, so I can say this, but <laughs> it's like everyone saying there, you know, there are no black men, you know, for roles. And you're like, well, there's tons of black men for roles if you're not going to MIT, Harvard, Stanford, and Princeton. If you're looking at other places, then you can find them. But if you're always going to the same pool, there's going to be a shortage. But I think we've yeah. missed explaining why this is so important, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. We've almost assumed that it's yeah. important to find black men, right? Mm -hmm. But what's so important about it is that if everybody thinks the same, that's a great way to go extinct, mm -hmm. right? Yes. We, we know that, that diversity <laughs> is the fuel yeah. that drives solutions, drives innovation, because you don't know where the solutions will pop mm -hmm. up from mm -hmm. and what kind of experiences that people have had in their lives that will, provide that. I'm, I'm an engineer. I won the Nobel Prize in chemistry mm -hmm. because I had a very different experience mm -hmm. in solving a problem. Mm -hmm. And this, I see this so much mm -hmm. on boards. And it could be diversity of experiences, but that mm -hmm. often comes right. with having a different, different gender background. or yeah. having mm -hmm. a different color. You mm -hmm. just lived a different experience. So that, that diversity really, in my mind, is a fundamental it's a fundamental flaw in a number of boards mm -hmm. that I've mm -hmm. seen, that, that lack of diversity. But when the board is diverse in experiences, those solutions just pop up. Mm -hmm. One of the issues that's been popping up since really COVID started is diversity in clinical trials. Mm -hmm. And you know, you think about the clinical trial history in the United States in particular, and we have not been thinking about who's not in the room, mm -hmm. who we're gonna treat. You know, you look at the, I think it's the pulse ox oxender that doesn't work well on dark skin. Mm. You know, nobody thought about that because no, none of the people in the room had dark skin, so they didn't realize that. Right, right, that's qu quite a challenge. Mm. Uh, one last question, Andre? 
So thank you very much for the fascinating uh, discussion and also sharing your great perspectives. I have a provoking question at the end. Um, from the statistics, I re read a recent statistics that 80% of the boards believe they're adding value. And if you ask the CEOs, they say 20% add value. <laughs> <laughs> so, so my question is, how do you ensure that you are value adding? <laughs> Well, I think I'm going to say this is perspective and, you know, currently operating and being on boards, a lot of CEOs and their management team spend time trying to figure out how to manage the board as opposed to how to learn from the and board use, mm -hmm. and use the board. So a little bit of that percentage, I think, can be changed mm -hmm. by uh, your perception and how you think about your boards. But then from the board side, I have been the recipient of a board that felt like a lot of gotcha as mm. opposed to, I'm going to help you. So as a board member, I like to spend a great deal of my time having, again, as I said, one-on-one -on -one conversations with other board members, but one-on-one -on -one conversations with members of management. And I ask the question, how can I best help you? And I think we all should be doing that. Uh, I've, been a, that on, oh, sorry. Sorry. I've been on a board where at the end um, of the board meeting with the lead director, we go around the room and say, was this a useful board meeting? Mm -hmm. what, what did we do in this board meeting that added value and what didn't with the CEO there? Um, and welcome the CEO having input on that. So I think that process of the 80-20 that you described should be as transparent as possible. Now, if they're struggling, especially if it's the CEO struggling, you're going to be closer <laughs> to the 20. Um, but but I, I, I think boards should not, and the, the best boards I've been on, don't assume that they add value just because they're sitting in a chair. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I think it's, it's a... Uh, it, it, the question is, what is your value add? Mm -hmm. what, what do you help management think about or address or tackle, uh, particularly the kind of diverse boards we're talking about, that they wouldn't have thought if you didn't exist? Which I think is a good question. So go ahead. Sorry about that. No, no. It, it, it very much the same thing. Also, does the CEO call you and ask mm -hmm. your advice? I, I yeah. know multiple of the members of the boards that I'm on, the CEO calls us mm -hmm. and says, you know, I need help with this particular thing. And maybe they don't. And I think that 80-20, it might reflect what fraction of the companies are in crisis or mm -hmm. facing difficulties, maybe 80 percent or just floating along at any one time. But, uh, it, you know, what, does the CEO feel that they can get some value added even yeah. about the individuals? Yeah. yeah. And, and I think coming into that boardroom, coming into that board role of always understanding where can I always think about how can I be that value add? Mm -hmm. And we've even had deliberate conversations with board members to say, what's almost your job description? Mm -hmm. you know, obviously, mm -hmm. you want to be able to capture many places where you could uh, provide value. But fundamentally, where are the handful of places? And that way, again, it goes back to what's your role? Why are you there as an individual? Why is there, are you there as a collective? And what can you accomplish together as the company evolves and changes? So with that, I'd like to thank the panelists, Francis, Cynthia, Sue, for a terrific conversation. And thanks to everyone who joined. And uh, we will see you soon.